his car was stolen all in one day. Um, and the, the good thing about Luke is he actually cared more about the animals than the car. So it kind of speaks to uh, his, his uh, kind of philosophy on that. So anyway, I'll, I'll let Luke take it away from here. Great. I'm going to kind of set the mood here and close the shades. So it's a little bit of an All right, thank you all for coming. It's uh, set these goofballs in the back. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about some research that I've worked on in the past years with all these great people here. Uh, but so let's start with just the motivation. So there are about 5 million people in this world that suffer from spinal cord injury. Uh, there's about 300,000 of them here in the U.S. And these injuries profoundly shorten lifespans. Uh, they result in millions of dollars of medical costs per patient. And they profoundly impact you know, the day-to-day -day activities that we take for granted. Uh, and so I'm going to show you video footage. This is a protest uh, from the 90s where a group of paraplegic patients uh, crawled up the steps of the Capitol to demand the passage of the Americans with Disability Act. And this is part of the reason why we have you know, wheelchair ramps and handicap stalls uh, and, and all of those things today. And so I don't, I don't think I need to spend too much time on motivation, but I think it's pretty clear, you know, um, this is important, and we want to kind of help this eight-year-old girl and the millions of people that are just like her. So I'm going to talk about two new technologies, uh, approaches for treating paralysis that have been de developed partially here at Caltech and in a couple other places. But um, before I do that, I want to just talk about, okay, how is movement... How does it work in our body, and what exactly does a spinal cord injury do? So voluntary movement is an interaction between a bunch of neurons in our brain that decide on an action that we want to take, and then a collection of neurons in our spinal cord that actually activate our muscles, right? And the connection between these two regions is called the corticospinal tract. And I'm going to show you a diagram of that in a second. But the general idea is that a message is, is generated in our brain, sends down our spinal cord, and activates our muscles. And this pathway, starts it, it, this tract our neurons that live in our brain here and they send axons all the way down our spinal cord to activate our spi uh, spinal neurons there. And this is the pathway that it looks like. So this is a slice of the brain up here. This is the cortex. That little region in green is where the neurons in the cortical spinal tract live. And they send axons all the way. They weave through the brain until they finally hit the spinal cord right there. And so a spinal cord injury, what it ends up actually doing is damaging this connection. So all of a sudden, the connection from the brain to the spinal cord, a spinal circuitry, is broken. But the underlying circuits in the brain and the spinal cord still exist after injury. So the idea of we want to use as a treatment for paralysis, while we can't connect the two, we want to ina interact either with the neurons in the brain and understand the activity that somebody's trying to think, or stimulate the spinal cord to re-engage the muscles to help somebody paralyzed to stand on their own legs again. Uh, so I'm going to show you two examples of this. One is going to be neural prosthetics, and this is the work that's going on in the Anderson Group, and you have much more qualified people sitting in that row right there that all work on this. And then the second one is the spinal stimulation that I've been working with Joel and Reggie. So, recording. So, the idea is, as I'm thinking about moving, there's a pattern of activity that occurs in my brain. And if we can record that pattern of activity, we can train a computer algorithm to predict what the person is intending to do. One of the ways that we can record this is using a device that's similar here. This is called a Utah array. And this is a 10 by 10 grid of electrodes. It's quite small. Uh, they, these are about a millimeter long. And at the tip of each one of these, you can record the activity of individual neurons. So the idea is, this is a, a patient, this man had been shot in the neck and paralyzed. So he's tetraplegic. A portion of his skull was removed. This array was implanted into a region of his brain. And they're able to record activity from his brain. To, uh, and predict his intended movement and use that to control a robotic arm. And so that's what you're going to see right here. So this is a patient who is, is paralyzed uh, in both his arms and legs. Thinking about moving uh, his arm, he's going to be able to take a, a drink out of a beer here. So here is this robotic arm, here's the beer, and he's able to control that by thinking. Right. So it's exciting stuff. So this is somebody who's, who's otherwise locked in a wheelchair. <laughs> And this, uh, this technology has applications beyond just spinal cord injury, also like ALS. As everybody knows, we lost Stephen Hawking last week, and this is something that, that could be applied to somebody like that. But so this is a really exciting new technology, and we want to understand kind of what's going on there. So again, this is t interacting with these neurons in the brain. The other option that we have is we can interact with neurons in the spinal cord, right? So as I said, neurons in your spinal cord actually activate your muscles. But they do more than that. So as I'm standing and as I'm walking around, 
A lot of that movement is actually controlled locally by my spinal cord. It doesn't need input from my brain. <clears throat> so the idea is, after the spinal injury, this, this spinal circuitry kind of goes into a non-functional state. And if we can implant electrodes, which is what you see right here, this is an array of electrodes that have been planted into the, onto the spinal cord, we can stimulate these, these spinal circuits and we can get somebody to reactivate these, these kind of circuits to stabilize walking and basic kind of movement of their legs. So what you're going to see here, this is a young man who had been in a car accident, paralyzed below the waist. He had a motor complete injury, so he had no sensation, no motor feedback. They implanted these electrodes onto his spinal cord and were able to stimulate in a special pattern such that this man who has, who's otherwise in a wheelchair can now stand on his legs. So this is a paralyzed man standing. And this is all controlled locally by neurons that are in his lower spinal cord below his injury. Okay? So these are the two ideas that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but for this technology to get better, we need to understand better how movement is generated by our bodies and also the interaction between neuron and electrode. Oh, Professor Prana. So uh, I'm going to talk about three projects that I worked on uh, that are all involved in this. So the first one is the electrode. So this is going to be kind of an engineering discussion about deep brain electrodes and how they, the, the nervous system interacts with that. The second is state estimation in the parietal cortex. And this is trying to understand the properties of a certain brain region uh, so with applications for neural prosthetics. And then the third I'm going to talk about is this recovery of voluntary movement. So the idea of stimulating the spinal cord and enabling the recovery of voluntary movement. Now we're going to start off with this engineering uh, work here, just talking about deep brain electrodes. So the two devices that I described to you, the cortical array and the spinal array, interact with the surface of our nervous system. But there are certain conditions, certain diseases in which we want to penetrate deep into the brain. One of those examples is Parkinson's. So if a patient, a patient with Parkinson's <laughs> has a damaged uh, structure in the center of their brain. And there are certain cases when, when medicine uh, is ineffective, one of the options is they'll cut a hole in the skull and they'll insert an electrode deep into the center of the brain. And this is what it looks like. So this is an x-ray, there's a hole on the top of the skull and there's a metal wire that penetrates straight into the middle, centimeters into neural tissue. And the idea is they can use this to stimulate the, the, the patient's brain, similar to like a pacemaker, it's just on, just kind of stimulating and help relieve some of the, uh, the uh, symptoms that, that come with Parkinson's. So I'm going to show you a video here. This is a patient who has severe Parkinson's. On the left, this is with the stimulator off, and you'll, you'll see the tremors that are associated with the disease. And this is with the stimulator on. And the doctor's going to ask the patient to make a set of hand movements, and you'll see kind of the difference. <coughs> so here he's able to, has nice, with the stimulator on, he can make these nice hand movements. But here his, his tremors are so bad he can't. You can't eat, do anything. Now these are medically, uh, these are, are, are medical devices. You can, people are implanted with them today. They're, they're very popular. Um, but you know, while I was doing my uh, nurse first working in monkey work, I was actually doing deep brain electrodes recording in the brain, and I got kind of concerned that about these devices. So in particular, the design of these, design of these devices is pretty simple. It's just a metal wire with a tip on the end, and it's coated on insulation. So this, this yellow is just insulation there. And I think there's a problem in that this is actually, when you insert this into the brain, this insulation is just going to form a capacitor with this neural tissue that's all around here, right? And that can cause all sorts of problems. The voltage can leak off out, across the, this insulation and, and stimulate things we don't expect, and also recordings can come across and you can get all, all the weird distortions there. And in looking at some of the circuit diagrams, I, I haven't seen anybody really take advantage or understand, okay, what's going on? Is, it, is this a problem? So I, my first work here was just to talk about trying to come up with a circuit model of these deep brain electrodes and study these stimulation properties. So to start this, I, we just made a very simple approximation of deep brain stimulation. So we treated the brain as a cylinder. Uh, we said we were going to put an electrode straight in the middle of it. And it's just a cylinder that's got pure insulation, so it's only contacting the brain with insulation. And by using kind of a, a circuit, uh, we can tr tr convert this into lump circuit elements using, you know, equations for capacitor, uh, cylindrical capacitors and resistors. So we can convert this little model into a circuit diagram here, where we say we have a stimulator. This is the stimulator that we're just trying to, to activate the, the electrode. <coughs> we have a capacitor that is the insulation here. We have a region of the, uh, the uh, portion of the brain that's re modeled as a resistor and capacitor here, and that's going to be this, this, this region here. 
And then we have another uh, uh, region of the brain which represents this section here. So what we want to know is what is the voltage in the tissue at this location given that we stimulate here? And by applying some, uh, you can approximate the values of the brain at these resistive capacitor uh, values of the brain. And what we get with, what we get from this is that the insulation around these deep brain electrodes acts as a high pass filter. Right, so if we stimulate at frequencies above 10 megahertz, it's going to bleed across the insulation into the surrounding tissue. Now, most people would say, okay, that's not really a big deal. Um, the most stimulation rates that we, we stimulate for deep brain are about 200 hertz, so it's not really, that's well, well below this 10 megahertz threshold. But I would beg, beg to, to differ with that. So when we say that we stimulate for two, at 200 hertz, what we actually do is we stimulate with a waveform like this 200 times a second. So we're not stimulating with a pure two, uh, 200 hertz sin sinusoid. What we're doing is we're, we're come pulsing in a big square wave, which has this very sharp transition from low to high, and then from high to low, and the same, same kind of there. And each of these transitions occurs in, in a fraction of a microsecond. And that's going to be right at that 10 megahertz threshold that, that uh, I showed you there. And so if we use this stimulation, we, we think that this is all going to be coming through the, the electrode and into the brain here. But if we apply that, that megahertz filter, what's going to happen is we're going to have a spike in voltage in the brain at this upswing, a negative spike in the downswing, and then another negative spike there. And these spikes are going to bleed across the insulation into the surrounding tissue. And this is a concern because, one, you know, we're not really aware that we're doing this. This could be causing all sorts of damage, stimulating all things that we don't really know about. Two, this effect is waveform specific, so this, this square wave here causes one, you know, a, a positive spike and a negative spike. This decaying exponential just causes a negative spike. So that's a problem because the safety protocols, the way that this, these things are, are designed, is they want to really balance how much charge is left in the tissue. So they push charge in and then they pull it back out. And they want to make sure that, that that's, that's uh, safe. Now this shows that some of that charge is going to leak into the surrounding tissue and it may not get pulled out with the, with the corresponding wave if we're not careful about it. Uh, and so that could cause charge to build up in the tissue, it could cause degradation of the electrode, all sorts of bad things. The other thing that's a problem is, and anybody who is recorded in the, in the body and stimulated at the same time, is that stimulation generates a lot of artifacts and recording. So this is uh, EMG activity that I recorded from the leg of a rat. And this is with the stimulator off, and we see we have this nice burst of EMG activity. And then I turn on the stimulator in the, in, the, in the animal's spinal cord, and we're stimulating at just a 40 hertz signal. And all of a sudden we get these big spikes in voltage, you know, in a recording that we're getting down on the leg. So we're stimulating here, and we're getting a, a, these spikes there. And I think it's likely that this, this capacitive effect is contributing to these, these stimulation artifacts. So uh, to confirm this kind of simplified model, I also generated a, a multi-physics model where I represented this, this cylinder as, as a radial slice. So, so if we just take a radial slice of that cylinder, here's the metal electrode, this is the insulation, and this is the brain tissue. And what, what I could do is I could apply uh, various frequencies sinusoidal frequencies to the top of this electrode and see how, how the voltage bleeds into the surrounding tissue. And so here, if we apply a kilohertz to the standard electrode, we get no effect. It, it, it gets totally blocked out by the insulation. If we apply a megahertz, all of a sudden we start getting this voltage coming into the tissue here. And at a gigahertz, it's coming through as well. Now one of the solutions that we can do to solve this is we can put a grounding plane around this. We can make a coaxial electrode so we can shield the, 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 the shank of the electrode. So here it's just uh, the insulation, a grounding plane of metal, another insulation, a layer of insulation. And if we do that, applying those three frequencies, we get nothing in the tissue. So we can block that effect from, from leaking into the tissue. So that's just a quick summary of this, this work on looking at, at, at deep brain electrodes. Uh, so just to summarize, this is a, a new circuit model for deep brain electrodes for both uh, recording and simulation. I didn't go over the recording aspect here, but uh, I can talk about that later if you're interested. But in general, uh, we show that the insulation around these deep brain electrodes acts as high pass filters. This has some concerns because it'll cause spikes in the surrounding tissue of voltage. Uh, this has problems with safety protocols that we use to, to protect the tissue and, and the, the nervous system of these patients. And it also can contribute to stimulation artifacts in recordings. And I also propose two solutions. One is uh, a coaxial electrode. This will block the effect in the surrounding tissue. And then two, uh, to protect this, this uh, biphasic concern of pushing and pulling current, I suggest that we, we match, we use identical waveforms to push in current and pull out current. This forces this, the right amount of current to flow in and out through the tissue there. Um, but I, I'm happy to speak about that after. So uh, 
The next step, what I'm interested in talking about, is uh, work in the brain. So this is gonna, I'm going to describe what state estimation is and, and describe the parietal cortex. But first, I just want to give a brief overview of neural prosthetics. So the patient that I showed you earlier, um, work that was done here, this patient has a set of electrodes implanted into his posterior parietal cortex. And that's a region of the brain that's, that's around here. Now traditionally, or in, in earlier studies here, people have, have recorded from motor cortex, which is a region of the brain that's around here. And when I describe to you that corticospinal tract, that actually exists around this, this brain region. So it's very, this is kind of the logical first place that people went to look for brain activity related to movement, right? And I'm going to show you, this is, this is work that's done out of brown. This is a, 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 a again, this is a, a tetraplegic patient. She has a set of electrodes here in her motor cortex, and she's going to think about moving that, that uh, robotic arm. So she's able to pick up the cup, guide it, and take a drink. So this is using neural activity that's coming from her motor cortex. But the other option, uh, as described here in, in, at Caltech, is you can also guide a robotic arm using activity from the parietal cortex. So this is a patient, uh, the same patient I showed before, and he's guiding the, the, the movement of this robotic arm on the screen just by thinking about moving his hand. Right? And so the big question is, uh, so we know that, that motor cortex is, is closely related to this output of our, of our brain activity. But parietal cortex is, is a bit more of an interesting area. Traditionally, it's thought to be this kind of uh, integration of, of our sensory modalities. So we have a lot of audition and vision, somatosensational converged to this brain area. Also, the, the signals that have been traditionally found in there have been more cognitive, like goal location, and not necessarily these kind of hand-to-hand -hand, uh, like, uh, movement kinematic signals here. But recently, only about 10 years ago, we found these signals, and the question is, is what is the role of this brain area in movement? And so, uh, one of the things that's informed us, and so what I'm going to say is, is try to, to make a case, is that the parietal cortex acts as a state estimator. And what I mean by state estimator is that it combines our sensory feedback with our internal uh, motor plan to predict where we are in space. And it combines these two signals to, to kind of estimate where the movement of our hand is. And I'm going to give you a few pieces of reasoning for why we think that. Um, and the first comes from lesion studies. So this is a, this is a man who has lesions in the parietal cortex, and he results in these interesting uh, uh, movement problems. So he has a, a, a disorder called Balint syndrome, and part of Balint syndrome is called optic ataxia. And so this patient has otherwise healthy, a healthy visual system. He can identify objects in the world. He can do all those things. He has a healthy motor system, so there's nothing interfering with his motor system. But he has major problems visually guiding the movement of his hand. So the idea is, this convergence of his sensory feedback with his, with his motor plan is somehow disrupted. So this man, uh, the doctor's going to hold out, I think he's going to hold a spoon, and ask the patient to reach for it. And you're going to see that he's, he's going to be unable to do that. Can you see it? I can see it, but I can't tell. I can't even So this idea is that this patient has this interesting behavioral problem, which seems to be he can't synthesize his visual feedback with his actual motor action here. Now what's interesting is that if we can actually induce this behavior, so this is uh, data that, that came from a non-human primate, and what they did is they, they injected uh, a chemical mucimol into the parietal cortex, which temporarily deactivates of, of the brain region. And they trained this monkey to do this hand movement task. So the monkey had his hand here, and then he'd have to move to a certain set of these locations. So he'd have to move here to there, or here to there. And these black dots are the the, the end point that monkeys reach when he's just normally trying this task. And when they inject this mucimol, all of a sudden we disrupt the animal's ability to do this behavior. So all you see that these red dots are these inactivated study uh, uh, sessions. The animal tries to reach for this goal but can't make it. He misses it. And this seems to replicate this effect that we see in the lesion patient here. So this idea that we can actually induce optic ataxia by inactivating the parietal cortex. And we can kind of disrupt this integration of sensory feedback with, with uh, our motor plan. And so to kind of formalize that a little bit more, um, we want to talk about this, this idea about sensory feedback control from, from motor control. So let's say I want to make a certain action, so I want to move to a certain location. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send a command, so this command signal U, 
that's going to transmit to my body. I'm also going to take a copy of that command signal, and we're going to, that's called the efforts copy, feed that back into our brain so we remember what we've been trying to do. And we're going to try to, and then we're going to predict what the result of that action. Now, we've also activated our body, which is going to generate sensory feedback that's going to feed back into the brain. And we're going to combine these two signals to predict where we are and use that as an error signal to correct our movement. So this is that, this idea about sensory feedback. And so our, our belief is that parietal cortex sits at this, this location in the brain. Okay? So we have uh, another set of reasoning to, to think that. And one of it has to do with this relative timing between neural activity and movement. So neural signals take time to propagate through our body. Um, so if, if I want to activate my muscles, the activity has to occur well before the muscle activity. And if I'm going to observe sensory feedback, my activity is going to occur after the movement occurs. So we want to understand this act, the, the timing relationship between when the movement occurs and when the neural activity occurs. And here's a little cartoon example. So uh, this, is, this blue line here is this velocity profile of a monkey's hand. And these black dots represent every time a neuron fires. And so what we want to say is, OK, if we look at this window here, and we count how many act, uh, uh, firings have occurred in that window, we can use that to predict where the hand is. And for our case, we're going to have a very simple prediction. We're going to use a linear combination. So we're just going to say something like the state of the hand x is going to be equal to a linear function of the firing rate. So very simple, right? We're just going to count how many uh, uh, action potentials he are here and predict that movement. And the next step, so uh, we're interested in how, when, when in this neural signal we should be predicting this, this uh, behavior. So as you can see, this, this window of activity occurs well before here. So what we can do is we can shift this window forward and backwards in time and use that to predict the hand at, at each step to see how well uh, this window of activity predicts that movement. All right? So we're going to shift this over here, count how many occur there, and try to predict there. And it's not going to do so well. Right? And we can shift it forward in time and back. And so that results what, what's called, uh, we're going to call an offset tuning curve. And this is results that, that were already uh, prior results where they took windows of, of prior activity and they shifted forward and backwards and they found that the, the peak time to decode uh, movement signals from the parietal cortex almost occurs instantaneously. Which is a surprising result because this means this activity is too slow to actually engage the muscles. We have to be backwards in time for it to actually be causally driving movement. But it's also too fast to be sensory feedback. So it can't be just pure sensory feedback. It can't pure be, be a, a, an action. So we're going to use this idea of, OK, the relative window. OK, what, what is the optimal window to decode the movement to try and understand where the parietal cortex sits in this diagram? And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to introduce a sensory delay. And so we think that. Introducing this delay is going to disrupt these three signals in interesting ways that's going to allow us to tease apart uh, their, their properties. And I'm going to show you exactly kind of the hypothesis we have for that. So if, if the parietal cortex encodes just purely a sensory signal, what we'd expect is this sensory delay would just shift the optimal time to predict, to decode this movement. So we'd see this curve that's normally, at, at this point, all of a sudden it would shift forward in time. Now, if, we, if, motor cort if the uh, parietal cortex encodes uh, a command signal, we would expect there really to be no effect. Because this activity causally drives the movement, a sensory delay will not disturb this relationship. So before and after the delay, we have a similar uh, a tuning profile there. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated with the state estimator. So with the state estimator, what it's going to be doing is it's going to be combining delayed sensory feedback with the current efference information. So all of a sudden, this signal and this signal are mismatched in time. So, so if you combine them, you're going to make bad predictions. So what we expect is that instead of seeing a shift in, in one way or the other, we see a loss in, in predictive strength. So all of a sudden, our ability to, to correlate parietal activity to hand movement would, would be lost. Right? So we see a drop in the, in the predictive strength of, of the parietal cortex. So we, we set out to do an experiment to prove just that. Uh, the idea is we had, we had two non-human primates. We trained them to make hand-reaching tasks. So one monkey did this center-out reaching task with an obstacle avoidance. You're seeing example hand movements. 
And the second animal did a 3D uh, moving task where he was moving his hand in 3D. And these all, both of these tasks were done in a virtual reality environment where the animal was looking at a computer screen and not at their action with their own hand. So during a subset of these trials, the animal made real-time reaches, so his hand position was displayed in real time. And then in a subset of those reaches, we delayed this, the visual feedback for the animal. So all of a sudden, you see, there's kind of a laggy cursor effect. And while, we, while the animal was doing this, we were recording activity from those, these arrays that I showed you earlier. So monkey M had an array implanted in the parietal cortex, and a second array implanted in his motor cortex. And then monkey R had uh, arrays implanted in his just in this parietal cortex. Now, I want to take a second, just there's, there's one additional step here, but so if we think of a uh, recording session occurring over time, so let's say we have just some timeline here, the animal is going to make a set of reaches at different times, right? Now what we want to do is we want to say, see how that tuning profile, this, this timing relationship, changes over time throughout the recording session. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take a subset of data. So we're going to take a collection of trials, and we're going to generate a tuning profile for that. right? And then we're going to increment this set for just one trial and generate another profile and repeat that process. And we have this, this just collection of tuning profiles. Right? And I'm going to display this as, as a heat map. So I'm going to concatenate them and make this into a 2D plot. I'm going to show you what that looks like next. This is kind of what the, that 2D plot looks like. So on this axis here, this is that timing relationship. So this is how the offset between neural activity and hand movement. And then on this axis, we're talking about the, the, the progression throughout the trial. So as the, as the trial progresses, we go further and further along this axis. Now, the data I have here, this is, this is for idealized signals. So I, I kind of faked this data. I wanted to confirm our little hypothesis uh, of, about how, this should have, how a sensory delay will affect these three types of signals. So the first uh, idealized signal that, I, that I, I replicated was a sensory signal. And so we recorded a monkey, uh, the, uh, the monkey and its hand movements, and we generated fake, a fake sensory signal, which was the animal's hand position plus a delay. Now, during real-time reaches, this delay is zero. So we have this nice tuning profile that, that is instantaneously related to the hand movement, right? Then during the, the delay, we introduce a 200 millisecond lag between the animal's hand position and their visual feedback of the position. And what we see is for this artificial signal, we see a shift forward in the same way that we'd expect to see that shift there, right? And so this kind of confirms our idea that, okay, a sensory delay would cause a shift in the tuning profile of, these, of this, this timing relationship. We repeated the same thing with the command signal. So this, just, this command signal U was just directly related to the hand movement. Uh, and we showed there's no real effect. So during real-time reaches, we see this nice consistent tuning profile. We introduce a delay and there's no real disturbance here. And this replicates what we'd expect there. There's no real effect in the sensory delay. Now with the state estimator, uh, the way that I, I, we kind of fake this data is that we took the animal's current behavior and also the, the behavior with that sensory lag and we just averaged the two. So it's just a very simple combination of the two. And we generated this as our error signal. As we see, in real-time reaches, when this delay is zero and these signals match, we have a very nice, clear, consistent prediction of the hand movement. But when all of a sudden we introduce this 200 millisecond delay, we lose tuning. So this, this drop in color means that we've, we've, we've got a weaker correlation between hand movement and neural activity there. So this is just kind of a, a, a little computational model that, that is trying to replicate our hypothesis of what we'd expect to see. So again, a sensory signal, we have this nice consistent tuning, we introduce a delay, and we see a shift in time. With a, with a command signal, we'd expect to see no real change between it. And for a state estimator, we have a nice tuning, and then we lose uh, the signal strength as we get to the sensory delay. All right? And so this is what it looks like, the real data. So there's an interesting result. So, so this is, for monkey M, this is the real-time reaches. We have this nice, consistent tuning. We introduce a delay. All of a sudden, there's a loss in signal strength, exactly as we would expect for this integration of sensory information. So we see that in monkey M. So this is a weakness here. Monkey R, we see a similar effect. We have a nice clear tuning. We introduce this delay, and, and there's, a, there's a drop in tuning strength. What was interesting is that over time, as the animal makes more reaches in this delayed environment, the tuning strength comes back. So the animal's adapting to the sensory delay. So we see all of a sudden a drop in strength, and then it slowly comes back. And, and so that's a, a really interesting adaptation effect. I mean, because we know motor cortex is the output of our motor system. We'd expect it to act as a command signal. 
And so this, this lack of response here is what we'd expect. So it's really interesting. Parietal cortex, we introduce this sensory delay. We see a disturbance of, of the, the correlation between neural activity and movement. But over time, the animal adapts to it. So this adaptation is interesting. So we want to see, OK, there's, there's a change in the animal's neural activity. But does this result in a change in the animal's behavior? Right? So we want to see, OK, is there a reason this, this signal strength comes back? And so we looked at the animal's, uh, the, the path of the animal's hand movement. Okay? So this is a, a three example reaches from monkey M as he was making those, those curved hand reaches. The black is, is how the animal performed when he was, his hand was displayed in real time. We have this nice, he starts here, makes a nice curved reach down to the goal, and he can acquire it, right? We introduce the sensory delay, uh, sensory delay, and he tries to do this red reach. He almost tries to replicate what he was doing before. He makes this big wide reach, and he tries to come in, and he doesn't do such a good job there. And over time, as, as he does more and more trials, this is, what, this is how his hand movement was later in the session. So you see that he's, he's kind of much straighter, and there's a clear change in the animal's behavior. So we wanted to quantify, okay, what is this change? Why has why is, why is he changed, adapted his movements like this? And so the way that we did that is, okay, we said we looked into this little section here, which I've blown up here, and we wanted to compute how long it took the animal to reach when he got within one inch, one centimeter of the target until he acquired it. All right, all right? So in real-time reaches, he was very fast. It took him about you know, 100 milliseconds to do that. We introduced this sensory delay. That's, this is in red. So right after the sensory delay, he's very slow. It takes him about uh, 260 milliseconds. And over time, he changes his behavior. And you see that he, he gets an improvement in, in how fast he can make these kind of fine movements. Right? So all of a sudden, he's adapted his behavior to, to better acquire the task. So he's, so he's changed something in, in his response. So we want to see if, if this change in behavior correlates to this change in neural activity. And the way that we did it is, is similar to what, I, what I'm talking about here. So again, we collected a, a, a set of trials that the animal made. We computed how long it took for each trial the animal to reach, get from this point to that point. And then we computed histograms of that, of that data. So we said, OK, what's the distribution of, those, of that time? So is, is the animal really fast? Is, is the animal really consistent? And, and things like that. And so again, we also did the shifting effect. So for each curve that we computed here, we computed the histogram of this behavior. And then we shifted it forward, and we saw how it changed in time. So, so as the animal does more and more and more of these reaches, how does this, the profile of these, these timing, uh, how does that change? And this is what we see. So here's the activity in the parietal cortex during real-time reaches, nice, clean, consistent activity. The behavior, we have this nice red line here that's very fast. And what this is showing is that the animal is very consistent and very fast in their movements. That time to complete that last section of the reach is very quick. We introduce this sensory lag. All of a sudden, this red becomes yellow, which means that the animal is more, less consistent in their behavior. But over time, as the animal makes more and more reaches in this environment, this, it, it, they start to shape, it starts to improve the animal's response time, and it gets more consistent in its reaches as you can see as the red kind of comes back here. And what's interesting is that this recovery seems to occur on a, on a similar time scale as this adaptation of this neural signal. So the animal's brain activity is changing in kind of correlation with the animal, animal's movement changing. So we see this in monkey M, and the same effect is seen in, in monkey R here, where it's got nice, clear, consistent, this red consistent tuning. We introduce a sensory delay, it gets less consistent, but over time it returns back to it. So we see this interesting effect of, of uh, the animal is, is adapting to their neural signals to this, this, this sensory uh, perturbation, and that's causing a change in their behavior, or maybe one way or the other. So to su summarize uh, this work here, uh, the idea is we use a visual delay to misalign sensory feedback from our efference copy. And we want to think the thought idea is that that would uniquely affect a state estimation uh, signal. We showed evidence that there's state estimation in the parietal cortex because at, at the onset of this delay, we see a drop in predictive strength. Um, and, that, and we also showed that motor cortex, as we'd expect, doesn't have this effect. And then we also showed uh, an adaptation effect. So the animal can adapt to these sensory perturbations, which, is an interesting, which has interesting applications for neuroprosthetics, which means that the, 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 the brain activity will, will adapt the, the, to uh, the movement of the limb, right? So if there's a delay in, in how long it takes the computer to predict the, the, first, the, the per patient's movements, the neural activity will kind of adjust to compensate for that. So we see this nice kind of adaptation effect here. And so this presents some reasonings for, for 
what role parietal cortex is playing in hand movement. And it gives us some evidence for, for why we should use it as a neural signal for, for uh, paralyzed patients. So uh, the last step that I want to talk about is this work on spinal cord injury and the recovery of voluntary movement. So based on the last discussion, I, you know, I, I described all this very interesting, complicated uh, motor control that all occurs in the brain. But it turns out that it's not all happening in our brain, that our movement is distributed throughout our nervous system. And the idea is that, as I described earlier, that a lot of our basic movements, such as standing and walking, occur locally from circuits in our spinal cord. So as I'm standing, I'm getting sensory feedback that is feeding in from my legs into these neur neurons in my spinal cord, and they're saying, okay, he's standing, we need to contract this muscle, we need to do this muscle, we need to kind of do that. And it all occurs locally in the spinal cord. And so I'm going to show you a, a result here. So this is a rat who's had a, a complete transection of, of her spinal cord. So the spinal cord has been open, cut, and there's actually been a medium inserted in between the two sections to prevent any regrowth. And this results in a, in a, a paraplegic uh, <laughs> rodent. It can't control its hind legs. But if we implant a set of electrodes here onto the lower spinal cord, we can stimulate the animal's spinal cord and re-engage these circuits that are involved in, in standing and walking. So again, this is a paralyzed rat. She's on a treadmill. I'm going I'm to play a video in just a second. And here's this rat stepping on a treadmill. This is purely coming from sensory feedback from her legs, telling her, okay, this is the next thing that we got to do. This is the next thing that we got to do. And she can adapt to different speeds on the treadmill. And she can even stand in, in that kind of notion. So again, this idea is that it's all occurring locally. This control, this motor activity is all occurring locally in the spinal cord without input from the brain. And this, is, this, kind of, uh, this idea is what led to human trials. This is, as I showed you before, so this same principle is, is, uh, was performed in this patient. So this patient is being stimulated in the spinal cord, and his local activity is able to stabilize his body position. Now, the patient that was, was selected for this was chosen uh, to have a, a worst case spinal cord injury. So he has no motor feedback, no sensory feedback. There's no connection down there. And they did that because, again, they, they wanted to interact locally with neurons in this spinal cord. They wanted to totally forget about anything from the brain. They just wanted to look at, at, at the behavior of these spinal cords. But something rather remarkable happened. So seven months after this first patient, uh, the, 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 the doctor said, move your leg. And all of a sudden, this guy can move his leg. And I'm going to show you video footage of this is a paralyzed uh, patient who has a motor complete spinal injury, being able to voluntarily move his leg. And it only occurs when he's receiving spinal stimulation. So when the stimulator is on, he can do this. When it's off, he can't. Left leg up. Down. So that's pretty remarkable, right? So this is this is a signal he has to hear it from his brain, send this across his injury site, and move his leg. And this was totally unexpected. Again, all of the foundational research had been done in these completely transected animals where the brain was completely disconnected from the spinal cord, and we were just looking at the spinal cord. So somehow this stimulation is allowing information to cross across this individual's injury, which is which was totally a total surprise. Now, it, <laughs> okay, so, so it turns out that uh, human spinal injuries are rarely this, this complete transection that I described where, where there's a complete cut of the spinal cord and something inserted in between. Typically, there, there's massive damage and, and there's a loss of all these connections. But some sort of dormant connection survived uh, throughout the, the spinal injury. They're just non-functional. And, the, and uh, at least the, the idea here is that by stimulating the spinal cord, we're able to kind of get these remnant connections that are, that are otherwise non-functional to reorganize and become functional circuits and allow information to pass through the spinal cord. Now, before we can actually, we want to, to better understand this mechanism and to better improve the treatment uh, options for these patients, we need to replicate this effect in the rodent. And, and use the study of the rodent to, to look at what mechanisms uh, are, are enabling this recovery. And so that was what I was tasked with. So my task was to try and replicate this idea of you tell the person to move his leg and he moves his leg. And I came up with a super, super complicated replication of it. Uh, I had a rat, that's me in the pink back there. This is a rat, this is before injury, and I trained this rat to, to kick her right leg in, a, in response to a sound. So I played a beat through a computer speaker, she kicks her leg, and I give her, give her a little Nutella on the end of the stick. 
<laughs> very, very complicated. <laughs> so, so this is video footage of, the, of this behavior. So again, this is, this is an intact animal, this is a healthy animal. This is acti electrical activity recorded from her muscle here. Here comes the bee. Bee plays, she kicks her leg, she gets a little Nutella. And she, they love Nutella. <laughs> now, uh, one of the ways we can kind of just confirm that we're at, we've actually been trained this behavior, what you see on the plot here, this is EMG activity from a single muscle, or, or tibialis anterior, uh, which is, the, I, I can believe the muscle right there. And what I've done is I've segmented, so every time the beep occurs, and the beep is random, so she can't predict when this is happening, I segment three seconds before the beep, and I segment six seconds after the beep. And each of these lines represents an individual trial. So the animal made a whole bunch of leg kicks, and, and she ate a whole lot of Nutella. Uh, <laughs> and we've, we've aligned it to this auditory cue, and as you can see, we have these bursts of, of EMG activity that align with, with this sound. So this animal is clearly generating muscle activity that is aligned to this sensory signal that we're looking at. So, so again, this idea is that the animal has to hear uh, a sound, process it with their ears, send a message down her spinal cord to activate her legs. Right? And so that's the fun bit. The next bit is not so fun. Uh, we then induce the spinal injury. Now, instead of doing that complete transection where we open the spinal cord and completely cut across, we did a different kind of injury. And this injury is called a, a simultaneous double hemisection. So the idea is that we cut across, halfway across, at two different spinal levels on opposite sides. So the idea is that there are a lot of long range, as I described, neurons that, that stretch all the way down your back. We cut across and we destroy all those connections on one side. And then we cut, come over here and we cut across and we destroy all the connections on the other side. And this results in paralysis. So the, the animal, if, if you, they, they receive this injury, they cannot control their legs. But the idea is that we leave a section of tissue right here that can reorganize and reconform to, to allow this movement to recover. Right? So that's, that's the idea of, of the injury model that we're going to try to replicate this effect of in the human, you, see, you, know, you know, we have this injury, but there are these dormant connections that can kind of reorganize. So this is how we're going to replicate that effect. And so right here, this is histology. So this is post-mortem uh, looking at the tissue. So this is a section of the spinal cord. This is the T10 spinal level. That's T7. This dotted line is the midline of the spinal cord. And I'm not sure, I think red doesn't show up so great on the screen. But uh, what you can see is that we have a large cyst, a large uh, injury that, that from this incision that was occurred at this level. And then at the T7, it's almost like atrophy, so the spinal cord's kind of withered away. But in general, we, we've made, we destroyed all the connections on this side, destroyed all the connections on the other. And I can show you a little 3D model by looking at various slices at various depths through the, the, the spinal cord. So this is just a, a way we can kind of confirm that we, we uh, actually made this injury throughout the, the spinal cord. So this, this red blotch represents this injury site, the green represents the other, and the blue represents the middle of the spinal cord. So we, we induced the spinal injury. It results in paralysis. You have these animals that, that can no longer walk. Now, two months after injury, I, I set them back up on the task. Uh, again, I'm in the blue, the beautiful blue back there. This is the rat uh, fresh out of her cage. So the stim she is not receiving st spinal stimulation. So right now, she's just paralyzed. She, she cannot control her legs. And what you're going to see is that she's not going to be able to do the task. Right. So stimulator is off. Here comes the beep. Beep plays. It should play. And, and she doesn't make any leg movement. I turn the stimulator on now. Here comes the next beep. Beep plays. And we get leg movement again. OK? Here comes the beep. Beep plays. And we get leg movement again. So this is a paralyzed rat uh, who otherwise you know, can't control uh, anything in her hind legs. But when we turn on the stimulator, she's able to voluntarily uh, control her hind legs. Here comes the beep. We see another set of leg movement. And as you can tell, there's a little bit of difference in how our legs are moving afterwards. Now the stimulator's off. Here comes the beep. Beep plays. We don't get any muscle activity. So this is mediated by the stimulation. We need the stimulation to recover the voluntary. And as you can see on the plot here, this is a comparison of the animal's performance before injury and after injury. And so before injury, she's very, she's, she's very fast. She can respond very quickly to this auditory cue. After injury, there's a significant delay, so she takes much longer to respond. And there's also significant uh, uh, variability in animal's response time. But again, we can clearly see that this behavior is tuned to this auditory cue. She's hearing a sound and generating leg movement in response to it. This isn't just random. So if we uh, 
there was a, a set of control rodents just to confirm our ideas that we've actually produced this effect here. So I had a set of animals where I trained them on this task so they could do this behavior. We induce the spinal injury, but we never treat these animals. And if we set these animals up, this is what their muscle activity looks like. We don't see any muscle activity aligned with the, this behavior. So spinal stimulation is needed for this behavior to occur. The other thing that we wanted to make sure is that maybe this is just some artifact of spinal stimulation or something weird going on. So I had a set of animals where I didn't train them at all in this task. They got set up in the same environment, but every time the beat played, they just got a, a, a Nutella regardless. They had a much better time. Uh, and so before injury, we see there's no coherent muscle activity. In response to the cue, after injury, with spinal stimulation, we don't see any muscle activity in response to the cue. So this isn't some weird artifact in animals like jostling in, 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 the, in, the, in the setup or doing anything weird. This is an effect that is mediated by a trained behavior that is mediated by spinal stimulation. So that's, that's kind of our, our, our thought there. Now, uh, the other thing which I showed you in the video is the speed of this recovery, right? So this is, uh, so here these are consecutive trials. In white are when the stimulator is on, in red are when the stimulator is off. And as you can see, when the stimulator is off, we don't get any behavior. But the moment the stimulator comes back on, it, it returns. So within a matter of seconds, this spinal stimulation is transforming this, this, this neural circuit into a functioning pathway. And it's occurring it's very, very quickly, right? That was actually a surprise to me that it was so fast. And the moment you turn it off, it disappears. So, that, so this is a very fast mechanism that's occurring. The next thing that we did is we wanted to play around with uh, so, uh, pharmacology. So we wanted to try to identify some of the pathways that are involved in this recovered uh, movement. So we used two drugs. So there are two drugs that are, have been typically used in research to study uh, these, these local spinal circuits. So in the, in the animals that are completely transected. And one drug is strychnine. Some of you may be familiar, it's, it's, it's cultured as a poison, but what strychnine actually is, is it's a, a, a glycine antagonist. So what it does is it reduces inhibition of a neural network. So it kind of cuts the brakes to, to a, a, a network of neurons. And the other one that we used is quipazine. And quipazine is a 5-HT agonist. It is effectively, you can think of this as like serotonin in the system. And both of these drugs, if they're given in the right dosage to a, to a spinalized rat, will act, this they will be beneficial. So the rat will, will be able to stand and do basic leg movements uh, just by, with these drugs. They're, they're helpful in that sense. So we wanted to see how, if we, get, if we dose the animal with strychnine or if we dose the animal with quipazine, how does it affect their behavior. And the general results, so the, on the top here, this is how the animal performed just stimulation. Uh, as you can see, we have nice, clear, consistent movement. We administer the animal strychnine. And all of a sudden, we start getting this spontaneous leg activity. The animals make a lot of these random movements. But you can still see that the animal can respond to this cue, right? We still have this kind of behavior that's locked to this auditory response, regardless of this kind of spastic or spontaneous behavior. Now, when we get quipazine, we have a different result. All of a sudden, the animal can't do this task anymore. There's no longer any clear response to this, this auditory cue. So somehow, playing with serot injecting the animal with serotonin, we've disturbed this, this recovery of voluntary movement. So that suggests, okay, if we disturb, disturb this connection, maybe serotonin plays an important role in, the, in this recovered pathway. And so to kind of further explore this idea of quipazine disrupting this behavior, we, I, we did a couple experiments looking at the effect of quipazine on this animal. So one is we wanted to say, okay, maybe quipazine uh, disrupts the animal's auditory system, or maybe it disrupts their ability to just do anything. They get just kind of too buzzed out and they can't do anything. So I, dose, uh, I administered quipazine to a set of animals before injury and see, saw it, that it does not affect these uninjured animals uh, from doing this, this kind of this, this behavioral task. But what this shows us is that quipazine is not disrupting the brain. So the brain is not, it is not the problem uh, with its quipazine here. Now we also, uh, as I described earlier, quipazine is, is beneficial for stepping and, and doing these kind of local processes as I described before. And this is, these are the same animals that I showed you. This is the same animal without. So the, this is after injury. This is the animal without spinal stimulation, either with nothing, just no spinal stimulation or nothing, or just with quipazine, right? And this is the animal on a treadmill. So as you can see, with the animal without anything is just dragging her legs. She can't make any leg movement. I give her a dosage of this quipazine, and all of a sudden she can make this really nice, clean stepping behavior. And what this tells us is that quipazine, this is the same doses that I gave them in this recovery of voluntary movement task. It's beneficial for these local spinal circuits here. It's not disrupting the, the, the network locally here. It's not disrupting up in the brain. So maybe it's involved in this pathway from the brain down, this recovered connection. 
Now, we wanted to kind of study this anatomically uh, to see, okay, we know that, that, uh, that serotonin, the 5-HT, comes from a particular part of our brain. It comes from the brainstem, the RAF nuclei. And that's where, so there are, there are neurons that live here and send long-range projections down, and that's where the serotonin comes from. We wanted to say, okay, is the, is the result, is, is, the, is, is this recovered pathway a result of those axons regrowing all the way down there? So can we look and look for axons from these 5-HT neurons in this lower spinal cord here? And so what we did is, uh, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to explain in a second what this is right over here. But uh, we wanted to, we, we looked at the anatomy of the animal in these lower, lower sections here to, to, to look for 5-HT. So what these images are, these are coronal sections of the spinal cord. So this is in the plane kind of like along my belt loop. And if we take a section of the spinal cord and we look at it, it kind of looks like this. So it looks, this is called the Cajal's butterfly. So this is in general what our spinal cord looks like. All our, our the, the neuron cell bodies live in this little H here. And these, these regions out here, this is where axons travel up and down our spinal cord. And what you're seeing in this, these images here, this is a close-up of this region of our spinal cord. And this region is called our ventral horn, and this is where the neurons that engage our muscles live. So they, they all sit right here. And if we're going to find 5-HT fibers, we can look at them, look for them in this location of the spinal cord. So this is a, a photograph of what that would look like. So this is, this is again, this is the zoom-in location of the, the spinal cord there. These little green splotches show the presence of 5-HT axons. So that's what we'd expect to see if axons had regrown down the spinal cord from the brainstem. So if this recovered pathway was just those, those long-range connections. But when we look into our treated animals, we don't see them. So this recovered behavior is not simply a regrowth of these long-range connections down there. But, it, but still, you know, so, so it's not a factor of just we have these long neurons that's regrown. It's likely to result in this kind of daisy chain connection of all these neurons that are kind of rewiring but regardless from these effects, it's clear that, that, that serotonin plays an important role in this recovered pathway. And it kind of can target a, a future analysis to look at, okay, well maybe the way that this recovery occurs is that the brain all of a sudden uses this, this, uh, the brainstem as a node to kind of get down there. It kind of connects, it's, that's kind of like this intermediate, intermediate connection. So the other thing that we did is, so, so this is, uh, I'm not sure how that looks on the screen, but so this is, as I described here, so this is, a, section, a lumbar section of the spinal cord. It's got this kind of butterfly effect here in blue. So each of these blue dots, is, this is a new end stain, which is a stain for neuron cell bodies. In red is an acetylcholine stain, which is a stain for uh, effectively motor neurons. So you can see these, these red kind of bulbs here. Those are all the neurons that activate our muscles. And green is, the over, it, it's, uh, is a marker for active neurons. So what, this is a zoom in of that section. So what you can see, we have little blue spots with little green dots that kind of coincide with that. And what that means, this neuron locally here was recently active. And so we wanted to say, study to see, okay, is there a change in the activity uh, uh, levels of the animal if they're treated versus if they're not treated? So can we kind of tease apart where the spinal circuit is in, in the anatomy? So what we did is we, so for each animal, so I had four animals that, that were trained, treated, and treated. And then we had four animals that were trained but never, never treated. And we want to see if there's something different in their, in their activity level of their spinal cord. So what we did is for each animal, I, I took eight sections throughout their spinal cord, stained it for this activity, identified each neuron in these slices to, if they're active, and we wanted to, to do cell counts here. So the way that we did it is we, we broke these sections into little grids, and we counted how many cells occurred in that grid. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is, this is effectively a discretized version of this, and each the color of this represents the, the average activity of neurons in that section. So I have this for treated animals, I have this for untreated animals, and we do a difference map of the two. And the idea is we, we, with this difference, we can see that there's increased activity. So this is the train, so I train the animals to do a, a unilateral movement, so they train just to kick their right leg, and we see that there's an increase of activity on that side, but we also see an increase of activity on, on the, the contralateral side. Uh, which shows that there we have increased activity on both sides of the spinal cord. Which, if, we, if you remember back on the behavior, the animal is making these kind of uh, bilateral movements, which we'd expect to see there. Now, the, the, the effect of this, the, the CFOS has been a little noisy. So this is kind of just total cell count. So total active cells for animals that were treated versus total active for animals that weren't treated. And there's 
and the increased elevation, but it's not significantly different uh, between those groups. So we may need to use uh, future markers, different markers for neural activity to try and tease out the location of this network. But uh, the last thing that I, I kind of wanted to talk about here was looking at muscle correlations. So I wanted to compare the animal's movement before and after the injury. So before the injury, the animal was making this clear unilateral movement. And the after the injury, they made this kind of fictive stepping behavior. Now, one of the ways that I looked at muscle correlation is I took the power generated in their EMG, and I did a cross-correlation between different muscle groups. So this plot here is the correlation between their right and left leg. And the, and the red line here shows that before the injury, there's not a whole lot of correlation between the right and left leg. And we introduce, after this delay, all of a sudden we see this big spike in correlation. So this means that when the right TA engages, about 300 milliseconds later, the left TA engages. We see this kind of like stepping behavior. And that describes, that shows that we have an increase in bilateral activity. So it's occurring on both sides, even though it's a unilateral uh, behavior. Also, this is a correlation between two muscles in the same leg. So this is the... Uh, Tibialis anterior is the muscle here, the vastus lateris is the muscle here, and we want to do a cross-correlation of that. And again, before the injury, we see a little bit of correlation between those, the, those muscle groups, but after injury, we see a much bigger spike in correlation between the, the muscle activity there. And what this is telling us is that the recovered behavior is bilateral, and it's, it's much more stereotyped than what it was doing before. Before, the animal had much more control over the movement, whereas after injury, it's, it's much weaker and much uh, decorrelated. So uh, just to summarize what, what was gone, went on here, so one, we just characterize this new behavioral task. And, you know, it's a very fancy task where we play a beat, the animal kicks, and she gets a reward. We show that this is a, a simple, stereotyped, and repeatable event-related task, which will allow us to do a lot of future work to study this recovered mechanism. Also, we show that this effect is a result of training and stimulation. You need to have both of those things to occur. So I think we, we, we kind of proved that this is a recovery of voluntary movement. And then the second is we kind of use this to study the recovered pathway. So one of the results that we showed is that the responses are significantly delayed. So it's, the animal is much slower in their response time. Their behavior is much more stereotyped and it's bilateral, as I said. Uh, the, the therapeutic recovery occurs within seconds of the simulator being turned on and off. We showed that serotonin plays an important role in this recovered pathway. And we showed an increase in bilateral expression in spinal cord to suggest the neural network are kind of the spinal network that's involved in this recovery is occurring on both sides of our spinal cord. It's not like just on our train uh, side here. So with that, I want to just quite briefly talk about some future work stuff that I, I'd be interested in doing in the future. So one is to, to use this task to start really teasing out the anatomical and functional connections of this pathway. So the first step is, is we can, now that we have the animal, we know that they're recovering this behavior, we can start recording in the brain, we can start studying what brain areas are involved in this recovery. How is their behavior changing before and after injury? And all sorts of those interesting things where we can, so we can record from the brain, we can stimulate in the brain, we can activate certain regions to like try to identify uh, what parts of the, uh, of the nervous system are involved in this recovery. In this example, you can imagine that we could inject the, the same inactivation drug that I described before into at various spinal levels to see if we could target where, which neurons are involved in this connection and we can try to better locate that. Uh, and then we can also use a lot of these advanced uh, uh, tracer studies and interesting histological techniques to try to identify the anatomical connections that are, that are regrowing. And by doing that, we can you know, expose new sites for therapeutic intervention to try and improve this uh, recovery. We can also use this task to optimize the, the electrode placements and the, and the stimulation parameters and do all those sorts of things to try to improve this recovery and voluntary movement. And by doing that, we can then translate that into human, which I think is really exciting. Um, but the final thing that I want to talk about is I, I think that, that there's really a, there's a marriage between this idea of activity in our brain and activity in our spinal cord. And the general takeaway that I, I took from this is, I, is anybody from the AIMS group here today? I don't know. Probably not. But Matt's, Matt's here. You, you know a little bit about robots. <coughs> so uh, the thing that really blew me away was watching this rat walk on a treadmill. So again, this is behavior that's occurring locally in the animal spinal cord without any input from the brain. And prior to coming to Caltech, as Joel mentioned, I was a computer scientist, and part of that work was looking at robotics. And so, as Patrick also, Patrick's here, right? yeah, uh, walking robots it, are really, really complicated. This is like super complicated math that goes in here, surprisingly. So, it, so if we look back in this kind of relationship, we say, okay, 
movement is some linear function of cortical activity that just assumes the spinal cord doesn't matter at all. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a, I, I, this doesn't make any real intuitive sense to me. And I think that there's also, you know, an ongoing debate about how well this kind of uh, representational framework fits between neural activity and hand movement. If you look at some of the work coming out of the Churchland group or, or the Chinoy group, they suggest that instead, uh, neural activity should be looked at as a dynamical system where we have a change in firing rate that's going to be equal to some dynamics of the, the cortical circuit plus our desired movement, right? And so this is kind of saying, okay, this simple model doesn't work so well. What we need to do is we need to change to a more dynamical systems. There's something more sophisticated going in the spinal cord. And I think that matches exactly with the fact that there's sophisticated internal dynamics in the spinal cord itself that can generate these, these stepping behavior. And the reason I think this is interesting is, is we have a, a unique way to study this. So we can study the same cortical circuit in the same animal before and after injury. So we can look at how the brain interacts with the spinal cord when there's a clear, nice, clean connection. We can then induce the injury. We have this different, this, this altered connection between the brain and the spinal cord. And we can see what changes. How, did, how does this, how does this, uh, you know, how do the dynamics of the spinal cord change in response to this, this injury, this new connection that's reformed? Maybe by doing that, we can learn a little bit about how movement is, is better encoded in the brain. So with that, uh, I want to just take a second to acknowledge the animals that were involved in this experiment. So the, the two monkeys that were involved, monkey M is Marduk, and monkey R is Razor. This is Razor hanging around at an uh, animal facility now. They've since been retired from animal work, and they're just chilling and, the rest of their days here. He's looking grumpy as always. Uh, and then uh, the, the rats, number one, two, three, four, five, six, six the second, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, they weren't so lucky at the end of these experiments. Uh, we euthanized them to look at, at these kind of anatomical uh, changes in, in, their, in, their, in their tissue. But, you know, this is important work and I, it was done with, you know, the utmost respect and care. So finally, uh, with that, I'd like to, to, I guess, begin my acknowledgments. First, I'd like to thank my advisor, Joel. Uh, he has been a complete support. I've just been able to walk into his office and say a bunch of weird ideas, and he'll just look at me and go, okay, let's think about that. Let's calm down. Let's just do it. All right. Uh, I want to thank Reggie. Uh, Reggie is a professor at UCLA with, with whom I did all of the spine and the rodent work. And he really just opened his lab to me and allowed some weird Caltech grad student to kind of get in there and play with his rats down there. I want to thank my committee, Professor Perona and Abu Mustafa, uh, for, for sitting here and, and spending the time with me today. I also want to thank uh, Professor Richard Anderson, with whom I did the, the uh, private work. That was where I started the first half of my uh, PhD, and a lot of the, the Anderson group is here today, which I'm really happy to see. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Phelps at UCLA as well. So she, in her lab is where I've been doing all these, these histology techniques and learning about chemistry and pipetting and all this weird black science that, that all the new chemistry. Uh, so on top of that, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hoi Zong and Eric McDale. These are two surgeons that did the, the rodent spinal injury uh, sur surgeries, and they are incredibly talented. I, I cannot describe to you how sophisticated, how delicate these surgeries are, and how talented these two individuals were. I want to thank uh, Vasilius, who's here today, and uh, Marcus, who I, I think he's going to come afterwards. But these were uh, the, these are the two postdocs that I've worked with on this idea of state estimation in the parietal cortex from the Anderson Group. And we've had many uh, lovely conversations, uh, heated conversations over coffee at the right over here, which I will miss. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, Mike Thornton and Katie Ingram. Uh, they assisted me. They did the bulk of the uh, histology work and perfusions of the animals and a lot of the anatomy stuff. And they, they kind of held my hand as I learned how to pipette clear liquids into clear liquids into clear liquids. And they were very kind about it, too. Uh, I want to I thank, I guess, the rest of the Edutine group and I, the rest of the Phelps group. Um, I looked to try and find a lab photograph for our lab, but we don't really have one here in <laughs> Mexico. That's the photograph of the lab, uh, you know, empty. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody for uh, putting, putting up with me all those years. Uh, I also, there's a, there's a whole cadre of, of morons in the back here. Uh, there's really too many to count. Uh, who, you all make me look a little bit more interesting than I actually am. Uh, so I really don't think I could have done any of this without you guys. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my brother and sister who are sitting right in the front row here uh, for being two goofballs. Um, and then also my parents who weren't able to make it out today to my mom and dad. 
Uh, this all really goes to show, uh, it takes a, a village to raise a <laughs> So, with that, uh, I'll have to take my question. Should be positioned over the lumbosacral margin there and stimulating that, that area. That's the, the expectation of the effect. What we need to do further kind of analysis of exactly what the stimulation is triggering and how it's, it's engaging in the essential pattern circuits. Okay, and then the other question, oh, just a clarification, is the other thing, the pictures that you showed initially about the um, walking in the road and everything you talk about how a lot of this comes from local circuits originating in the lower half of the body and then there was that small video of that spinal cord injured patient the complete injured patient the motor complete injury guy uh, with the spinal cord stimulator who you ask to move his legs or whatever and he does stuff yeah i'm assuming that guy is truly a complete asia a spinal cord injury the model which you use, the, the double hemisection model, that in a human patient would be the equivalent of two rounds of cord syndromes, which are hemisections of the cord. Sure. And technically, by definition, all rounds of cord syndromes and all hemisections are incomplete injuries. And I mention rounds of cord because amongst the incomplete motor injuries, rounds of cords have the highest. Uh, rate of recovery and the best prognosis. Sure. So there, there's an interesting effect that if you, so we induce these spinal injuries simultaneously in the same surgery. Sure. If you stagger them, so if you, if you make one injury, you let the animal recover, and then you make the other, the animal can recover. And we, get, we chose this, this, this injury model in particular um, because it's, it, we can replicate uh, this surgery in multiple animals. And there's also proof that that connection between uh, that region can reorganize. But so the idea is that we want to disrupt the normal connection, and you, we use that as kind of our first uh, approach. But the, again, this, this, this behavior can be extended to any other kind. We can use a contusion model, we can use any other kind. We can lice different pathways, we can do all sorts of other things. I think the only reason that I'm bringing this up, and um, I could be completely off base here, but the thing is that uh, two penny sections would be an incomplete injury. I thought from the earlier portion, earlier slides within the spinal cord section that your goal was to try and understand how complete injury patients recover or could recover. So the, the simultaneous double hemisection rodents yes. results in yeah. like motor complete response. These animals do not have motor control. Not. And that's been replicated in multiple labs. Okay. This is actually the first time anyone's ever got a double hemisection rat to do anything. And it's only with Just a quick question, you know, with the, the spinal cord injury. So, did the patient recover any kind of uh, sensation besides, you know, the motor function? Do they, do, they, do they feel, you know, that they're like stand up and do they feel feet or just, you know, like they... Because it's going to be like kind of weird, right, like to stand up but with not feeling, you know. Just asking, you know, from if you interview, you know, these people and ask them, you know, how they're feeling, you know. 
Sure. I, I haven't worked too much on the human side of stuff, so Reggie and Joel could respond to that. Yeah, the, uh, the sensory side responds well, and, well, responds to. Interestingly, uh, the sensation is not normal, but just the fact that they regain some sensation, and it differs with different subjects, uh, but there's quite a bit of sensory recovery as well. One more question from the clown suits. <laughs> so I don't know, this doesn't seem like it's in the scope of this thesis, but the in the state estimation uh, section of the thesis, you showed that over the course of trials, that the that the primates or the non-human primates, I guess is more exact, uh, were able to kind of figure out what they were doing and, and regain the ability to complete the task. Do you have any theory on where uh, in that block diagram that you that you drew and I guess the prior cortex or Sure, like what, what structure is it now? Where is it refiguring it out? Is it in the state estimation? Is it, is it in the, in the feed-forward control? Or is it in something about the way that it processes the sensor data? That's a good question. Uh, the fact of the matter is I don't have a good uh, statement. Of so. so it could be a matter of just all of a sudden the animal can uh, adapt to this the sensory uh, perception. Like it's all of a sudden saying, all right, the sensory is del delayed, so I'm going to use, I'm going to adjust to that. So that could occur in our sensory system. Uh, or it could occur you know, at a multiple, multiple different locations. So I don't really know. I don't have any direct evidence for it in particular. But uh, yeah, it could be uh, like further uh, upstream from the parietal cortex that's causing that, that, that adaptation, but we don't know. But it's, that would be an interesting experiment to try and look to see if it in particular, the parietal cortex in particular is the, is the region that's adapting to the delay, which we could do by looking at structures further upstream to see if they respond to Okay, uh, actually one quick question, but I'll just mention one thing and I will let you do your question. Um, actually, Luke's going to stay for a couple of months for a short-term postdoc, so you have time to continue the discussion beyond today. It's not going to disappear. Sure. Um, uh, but in a minute, the committee does have to do the closed session because it's late Friday afternoon and people want to move on. Uh, so the last question. Yeah, in your prior cortex measurements, so you attribute a drop in the signal to, um, to, to the state estimation, but in your simplified explanation of where why state estimation would be correlated with the drop in signal. It also seems to be that that drop in signal is directly correlated with an increase in the breadth of the signal. But you don't seem to observe that in the data. Do you have some? Yeah, well, so, so the, the, the little example that I use of like this idealized state estimator was this average between the two. There's no reason that the state estimation has to be a linear average between the two. And, and so the reason you have that kind of that spread of it is because all of a sudden you have a delayed signal and a real-time signal and you're averaging, so you kind of, both of them are coming down. That, I think, is mostly just an artifact of our simple model of state estimation. Um, so there could be just a more sophisticated integration of, of sensory feedback with, with the efference copy um, than, than what, I, what I just modeled there. But the, the idealized signal is just as a way to kind of hypothesize as what we'd expect to see. All right, well, let's thank Luke again. Yeah, so I think I have the room upstairs.